Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our online service for this Sunday, October the 24th. Uh, we are able to meet together in person in the community centre for chapel. Uh, last week was our first week, uh, and it may be that some of you are there with us now. But for some, you're unable to be there because of the numbers or you can't get out. And so we continue to offer this online service for the next few weeks anyway. We hope that one day soon we'll be able to all come out in all of our number and gather together on Sunday afternoon. But as I said, in the meantime, we continue to do both. Those that can be there on Sunday afternoon will be there. And this is online for those that can't make it. Or maybe you're a glutton for punishment and you're watching this later in the week. You've already been to church on Sunday and you're watching and listening again, in which case gold star to you. We're going to continue our series today in 1 Peter, reading the second half of 1 Peter chapter 1. But before we get to that, we're going to have a song. And uh, this is uh, a new version of an old favorite. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, uh, sung for us by the good folk from Emu Music, who have very graciously made their recording available for us to use uh, in our online services. So here they are, Emu Music with Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. John chapter 14, starting to read from verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. 
for he lives with you and will be with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me any more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands will obey them. He is the one who loves me. He, is, he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my words, they belong to the Father who sent me. And this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This afternoon I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 reading from verse 13 to 21. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with per perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Last week we saw, in the opening section of 1 Peter, that Peter urged his Christian readers both in the first century and in the 21st century, to understand that we are God's people and that we are strangers in this world, just passing through on our way to our true home, which is in heaven. And at the heart of the second half of chapter 1 is the call to be holy. In particular, look at verses 14 to 16. Peter writes, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. That's a quote from Leviticus, and it was an instruction from God to Israel. But Peter, as he so often does in this letter, takes what God had said to Israel and applies it to the church. As the children of God, he says, we are called to be obedient to our Father and to be holy as he is holy. Now, it's important to get the logic straight here. He's not saying that we have to be holy to be saved. That would be salvation by works. If you're good enough, God will accept you. But we know that none of us can do that. None of us is righteous. 
None of us can save ourselves. Now, we're not called to be holy to be saved. We're called to be holy because we're saved. The work of salvation has already been done. Jesus did that for us at the cross. Uh, we're all familiar with John 3:16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What do you have to do to be saved? Believe in Jesus. Or in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, if we could save ourselves by being good enough, by being holy enough, then we could spend eternity in heaven boasting. I was good enough to get here on my own. Uh, I went, when I got to high school, I got sent to a boarding school in England. Uh, the school was called Christ's Hospital. Uh, it was founded by King Edward VI in 1552. Uh, you thought your school was old. And the uniform hadn't changed since 1552. And uh, it was full of tradition. Uh, it was a school that we would call a selective school. You had to pass an exam to get in. Except for a few students who were sponsored to go there by businesses or an organization or the army or whatever, sponsored to go there without passing the exam. And these sponsored or scholarship students were differentiated from the rest of the students in the school because they had this badge or plate sewn onto their uniform for all to see. And I'm sure it wasn't intended this way, but in my time there, it was always seen as marking those students out as different to the rest. We all got here on our own merits, but you, with the badge on, got here by charity or grace, if you want to put it that way. Imagine if heaven was like that. If we had different colored halos, depending on how we got there, some swaggering around with their gold halos, proud that they got there on their own achievements, looking down on the ones with silver halos that indicate we only got there by the grace of God. But there won't be two groups in heaven. We will all be wearing the I only got here by the grace of God halos. No one will be able to boast in their own achievements. God has done it all. Now, if you look through this passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, it just keeps jumping out at you. Verse 2, you were chosen by God. Verse 3, by his mercy, God gave you new birth. Verse 15, God called you. Verse 18, you were redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Verse 23, you have been born again through the word of God. Notice two things there. First, none of this is our doing. It's all God's doing. Second, all of those phrases, all of those expressions were in the past tense. We don't hope to be saved. We have already been saved. We don't hope to be born again. We already have been born again. We don't hope to become children of God. We already are children of God. But, Peter says, now that we have been saved, now that we are children of God, we are called to be holy. And there are three reasons that were given for that in verses 14 to 17. First, in verse 14, we're called to be obedient children. For most of us, childhood is a long time ago, but I'm sure you can remember wanting to please your parents, or at least not wanting to disappoint them. As God's adopted children, out of love and gratitude for what he's done for us, out of a desire to honour him, we should want to please him by the way we live. Second, in verses 15 and 16, we're called to be holy because our Father is holy. That is, we ought to, it ought to be inherent in our nature as children of God, to be like him. Are there characteristics that run in your family? 
uh, we have the Reed nose. All the men in my family, fortunately not the girls, inherit this funny nose that just gets more and more pronounced and recognisable as we get older. And it's not just genes that we inherit, it's interests. I grew up with a father who loved old cars and was always working on or wanting one. Guess what? I'm the same. That's not genetic, but it's learned in childhood. And just as we have family resemblances within our earthly family, so God wants to see a family resemblance in his heavenly family. He wants to see his children take after him in holiness. Finally, in verse 17, Peter urges us to live out our lives as foreigners here in reverent fear. Now, remember, Peter's readers were constantly in fear. They were under enormous persecution that came from the very top. They had every reason to fear the wrath of the Emperor Nero. But Peter reminds them that there's one far greater whom we should live in fear of. The God who will call us all before him to give account of our lives. In those short verses, three interrelated reasons to be holy. Out of obedience to our Father as a natural expression of our nature as God's children, and out of fear of the one who will judge us all. All of which means that we cannot, as children of God, just continue to live as we did before, as the world around us do. We must change. We used to belong to the world, and were sinful just like everyone else around us, but now we belong to God. And are called to be different to the world around us. Different to what we used to be like. Have you ever made a significant change in your life that meant changing your habits, your values, your way of life? I remember when my family moved to Australia, I had to learn to be Australian. Unlearn being British, learn to be Australian. Changing the way I spoke. I can remember distinctly uh, in my early days here practicing saying good day properly because when I said hello the old English way people looked at me funny so I worked at changing my voice changing my accent learning to speak Australian changing my sporting interests learning to appreciate rugby league which I never watched in my life before having to adopt a team fortunately the Illawarra Steelers started up uh, much the same time as, as I had, had to take an interest in rugby league. Later, of course, they were uh, became part of a partnership with the Dragons. They're still my team today. Changing my loyalties, learning to cheer for Australia instead of England in the ashes. And ultimately changing my loyalties officially. Going to the Picton Town Hall in 1989 and taking out Australian citizenship. And I got a certificate and I got a Bible, and I got a, a, an Australian native tree in a pot, which died not long after. When we join God's heavenly family, our loyalties change overnight. Yesterday I was a citizen of the world, today I'm a citizen of heaven. But now I have to learn what it is to be a citizen of heaven. I have to learn to live as a child of God. Our lifestyle, our standards, the things we invest in, the things we do and believe in and stand for should change to reflect God's standards, not our own anymore. And that's one of those things that's easily said, but not easily done. It doesn't come easily and it doesn't happen overnight. It's a conscious decision that takes commitment and determination and persistence so in verse 13, Peter urges us to cause us to take on this task with minds that are alert and fully sober. Work out this. Let me illustrate uh, how hard it can be to give up our old ways by telling you about St. Augustine. St. Augustine was one of the most powerful and influential figures in the early church. In his early life, he was a great intellectual and academic but not a Christian. He lived in relative luxury and he enjoyed a hedonistic life of sin. His mother, Monica, was a committed Christian 
and she worried over her son and she prayed earnestly for his conversion. And one afternoon, as Augustine was sitting in his garden, he heard over the wall some children singing. Take up and read. Take up and read. And he believed that God was talking to him and telling him to take up and read the New Testament. So he did. He took up his Bible. He read it and he was converted. And he became a zealous preacher of the gospel and ended up as the Bishop of Hippo. Um, That's a region in North Africa, not the animal. As well as a great preacher, St. Augustine was also a prolific writer, and he's left us a 13-volume autobiography called Confessions. And in that autobiography, as he talks about his sinful youth and then his conversion, he records that at one point he prayed this, Lord, make me chaste, that is, sexually pure, but not yet. Lord, I want to change, but not yet. And I suspect his struggle is one that we all experience. We rejoice in the fact that God has saved us freely by his grace. And we know that he wants us to change. But we sometimes struggle to give up our old ways. But that's what he calls us to do. Not just to go with the flow of what the world around us is doing, but to live out the values of the kingdom of God. To be holy, as the one who called us is holy. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we can gather together in your name to praise you, to bring you our requests. And especially now, Lord, that we can meet in our own church at five here. At this time of COVID, still active in our world, we thank you that our village has been protected thus far from this COVID. And we continue to pray that you will keep us all free from this infection. Father, we ask you would enable us to experience sweet fellowship with you and persevere in our Christian walk, looking to Jesus for support and enlightenment as we read your word and seek your guidance in our lives. Lord, we thank you so much for our wonderful staff here at DRV. Please continue to guide Jen, Carolyn and Sarah and our cafe staff as they lead us and look after our needs in the village and uh, please support their families as well. Thank you also for our great chaplains, Faye and John, as they guide us spiritually and minister to us. And Lord, please protect their families as well. We think of any residents who may be feeling isolated lonely or anxious in any way. Enable them to know your presence and love and help us all to remember that you have promised that if we seek you with our whole heart, we will find you. We bring before you our Lord, our link missionaries, especially Angela Michael in Pakistan. Please keep her safe and well during unrest there it's a troubled country lord enable her to tell those people she ministers to about jesus and bring your peace to the people she ministers to especially to her colleague arthur who's fallen away from his faith and we pray that you might restore his faith and that your holy spirit will be working amongst angela's community building them up drawing them to you. We ask this too for the millers in Spain, in their ministry, particularly to the youth there, that it may prosper even in these difficult times and that the whole Miller family would be revived and be used greatly to bring the good news of Jesus to the people under their care. 
So too would you abundantly bless the ministry of Michael and Mary Duckett and their family in Campbelltown as they tell the good news of Jesus to the Aboriginal culture there. Please keep them safe from the COVID-19 infection and so too would you prosper the work of Nungalinga College as it trains people to bring the good news of Jesus to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. And now, Lord, we pray for the leaders of our world that they would govern their peoples fairly and with compassion. And particularly, we pray for the people of Afghanistan, Myanmar and North Korea. And we pray that Christians in those countries may be treated fairly and not made to suffer for their faith. We commit to your keeping the leaders of our own country. Please give wisdom to our Prime Minister Scott Morrison and to our new Premier Lord and to their colleagues that their decisions for Australians would be to our benefit and that order and justice would prevail in our land and in our position in the world. Please keep us mindful of the needs of others and enable us to share our benefits with those less fortunate. Lord, we think now of our higher school certificate students this year and ask that safe arrangements may be made for them to undertake their final exams and that you would keep them calm <clears throat> and able to submit their very best efforts in such an uneasy environment that prevails particularly this year. And Lord, just many of us in the village have grandchildren affected like this, and we pray for their benefit too, Lord. We thank you for all the teachers endeavouring to prepare their students for the HSC. Bless both students and teachers alike as they prepare. Now, Father, thank you for your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. And please enable us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on him. And it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome back to Sing Along with Kev. And today, Julie's going to be playing along with us on the piano. Thank you. 
spies were saying please take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and cheer the love will find us solace there thanks Julian thank you for tuning in See you next time.